Each one is each one is welcome to this very special webinar. One of the biggest cause, which is pneumonia being one of the biggest causes of death for children under five years of age. It affects also adults, particularly the elderly. Also, the top reason for people living with HIV ending up in intensive care units of hospitals is not heart disease or accident, but pneumonia. Before I welcome our star moderator, the award-winning journalist of South African Broadcasting Corporation, Mr. Ashok Ramsarup, who is live on this webinar from Durban, let me please make a few housekeeping announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists are presenting. No need to wait till the end. Just type your questions in using the chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen during the question and answer session. I also request the two panelists to please keep to the time to present in time so that we have sufficient time left for question and answers. Over to you Ashok. Thank you Shobhaji. I'll bring you warm greetings from South Africa, Durban, from the port city of Durban. Over 900,000 children die of pneumonia every year. Despite being preventable, pneumonia continues to be a top killer of children under five. Pneumonia also wreaks breathtaking havoc in lives of adults, particularly the elderly and people living with HIV. A new report was released around World Pneumonia Day on the 12th of November 2015, which shows that India has the highest number of pneumonia and diarrhea related deaths among children globally. Two 297,114 deaths. A noted expert, Lot Prevor Dam, who has kindly agreed to be on the webinar panel, will share some details today. Also, let me share that 46 World Conference on Lung Health will also be held in Cape Town, South Africa. This conference has important sessions on a range of lung health related issues, including pneumonia. So those journalists who are going to this conference, please do attend these sessions. For more, for, for more information, please check out the conference's official website, www.worldlunghealth.org. The conference theme is a new agenda, Lung Health Beyond 2015. CNS correspondents will provide conference coverage, so follow CNS for updates from Cape Town Conference. Well, today in this webinar, we have distinguished panelists, Dr. Amita Pandey, professor in, in Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at King George's Medical University, KGMU, is among us as an expert. Well, let's begin. It's over now to Dr. Amita Pandey, who will give us a version or perhaps let us know what's happening in the world. Thank you, Mr. Ramshur and Suramsuru. It's indeed my privilege to be here with all of you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes we can hear you very well. Yeah, so I would be talking about prevention of neonatal deaths from pneumonia. Being an obstetrician, it's very natural that I deal mainly with the neonates and I'm answerable to the couples. About the well-being of the neonate. So I would basically be concentrating on prevention of neonatal deaths from pneumonia. Now as Mr. Ram Swarup has already mentioned, as far as the statistics are concerned, Pneumonia and diarrhea are the greatest killers of children under five globally, accounting for one in four deaths. Now, when we look at the incidence of pneumonia in children under five, it is estimated roughly to be around 156 million new episodes each year worldwide. These statistics are from 2014. And out of these 156 million, almost 151 million are from the developing countries and with 2,97,114 deaths India tops the list of these countries. 
and WHO estimates that death due to pneumonia occurs in one out of every three cases of pneumonia and hence the reason why we need to be very aware of this condition and we need to go ahead and do something to prevent it. Now mortality due to childhood pneumonia is not because of infection per se but is also strongly linked to other conditions like malnutrition which is so prevalent in these developing countries, poverty and inadequate access to health care. In India, the disease is more frequently seen in the rural and the urban poor naturally because they are the group who are more exposed to malnutrition, who are poor and who have inadequate access to health care. Now when you look at the type of neonatal uh, pneumonia, it, is, it can be infective and it may be non-infective. Today we would be concentrating more on the infective causes which are more prevalent and account for almost 90% of these cases of neonatal pneumonia. And the infective causes include the GBS, the Haemophilus influenzae, Enterococci, Gram-negative cocci and of course the Staph aureus. Now where do these neonates get the infection from? The neonates can acquire the infections transplacentally during pregnancy from over the subclinical maternal infection. They can also get this intrapartum during delivery by passage of the fetus through an infected birth canal or also by ascending infection if the delivery is delayed after rupture of membranes by more than 18 hours. These neonates can also also acquire the infections immediate postpartum from contact with an infected mother directly like tuberculosis which is usually spread to the neonates like this or through breastfeeding as in the case of HIV or CMV positive mothers or also from contact with healthcare practitioners and hospital environment what we commonly call nosocomial infections. Now when we look at the risk factors for neonatal pneumonia the common ones are preterm labor because preterm neonates are highly predisposed to develop pneumonia and how it happens we'll be discussing soon. Then if the mother has premature, pre-labor, preterm rupture of membranes for more than 18 hours, if there is any sign of infection in the mother because of premature rupture of membranes, what is commonly labeled as chorioamnionitis or if there is maternal genitourinary infection or if there is recurrent maternal urinary tract infection, antenatal infection in the mother which are known to transmit transplacentally. Now these are all risk factors for neonatal pneumonia. The other common contributing factors are the ones which are well known to us like malnutrition, vitamin deficiency, illiteracy of mothers resulting in unhygienic and unhealthy practices, unhygienic living spaces, bad health planning and low budgetary allocation for health. A few po points which are very commonly seen in developing countries. Now when we look at the pathophysiology of neonatal pneumonia, we would be able to understand why it is so common in this group of children. The limited defense in fetus leads to early dissemination of the infection. Hence, if the, the fetus gets this infection congenitally during the antenatal period, it gets disseminated very fast. Secondly, this infection causes infiltration and destruction of the bronchopulmonary tissue. As a result of this destruction, there is fibrinous exudate into the alveoli, leading to inhibition of the pulmonary surfactant function and leading this leads to respiratory failure in the neonate. And the presentation is absolutely similar to respiratory distress syndrome which we see in preterm neonates and differentiating the two in a premature baby can really be very, very difficult. Now when we look at the types of neonatal pneumonia, they can be early onset or late onset pneumonia. Early onset pneumonia are seen in less than three days of age. They first manifest at or within hours of birth and they usually result from organisms acquired antenatal or intrapartum. And the symptoms may appear as early 
within six hours of birth. And so we as obstetrician also have to be aware of this problem and have to take note so that timely referral of the baby can be done to a pediatrician if one is not immediately available. The late onset neonatal pneumonia occurs after three days of birth. This is usually acquired from the environment, usually infective, more likely in preterm infant, particularly those with prolonged hospitalization and use of IV catheters, obviously. The signs and the symptoms are just like the um, infants. There is an elevated respiratory rate, there is retraction, grunting, nasal flaring, noisy respiration, but sometimes the neonate may also present very aberrantly. They may present with poor feeding and abdominal distension. And one must always keep in mind that a neonate with poor feeding has to be screened for pneumonia. There is increased secretion in the airways and there may be just central cyanosis as a marker of neonatal pneumonia. The common investigations that help us clinch the diagnosis is complete blood count, a chest x-ray, blood culture, inflammation markers and arterial blood gases. Now the goals of therapy as far as doctors are concerned are eradication of infection naturally, providing adequate support of gaseous exchange to ensure survival and well-being of the infant, decreasing long-lasting lung changes that adversely affect the lung function, quality of life and susceptibility to future infections and providing parental nutritional support which should not be neglected. As far as the morbidity following neonatal pneumonia is concerned, mortality is well known but we must also know that morbidity is very common following neonatal pneumonia. The common cause, causes are chronic lung disease, prolonged need for respiratory support, childhood otitis media, reactive airway disease, and the severity of subsequent childhood respiratory infections which is highly increased in this group of neonates. Mortality following neonatal pneumonia is also very very high. In fact early onset sepsis the mortality rate is as high as 3 to 40 percent and in late onset sepsis it is still on the higher side around 2 to 20 percent. The fatality rate is two to four times higher in low birth weight infants than in full term infants. And extremely low birth weight infants who develop sepsis have a significantly greater risk of poor outcome. Now let us see how we can prevent and control this neonatal pneumonia. Apart from the general preventive measures, which I would be just outlining in this slide, we also have to focus on the treatment that we have to give to the mothers. As far as the general treatment, pre preventive measures for the control of pneumonia are concerned, we have vaccination for streptococcus pneumonia and HIV, that is Haemophilus influenzae B type, access to care and use of antibiotics, that is very important in developing countries with poor resources, an appropriate facility for case management should be there at the hospitals in the periphery, especially the PHCs and the CHCs. Exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life has been shown to have a protective effect. Besides this, control of indoor air pollution and provision of a healthy environment is also very essential. Prevention of exposure to tobacco smoke must be emphasized. And the parents have to be educated about simple measures like hand washing and prevention of future exposure. Longitudinal surveillance with future problems is also important. Now as far as the maternal aspect is concerned, improvement in maternal nutrition and prevention of low birth weight is very important because as we have already discussed, Low birth weight in uh, neonates are more predisposed to develop pneumonia, more predisposed to infections as compared to the appropriate for uh, gestational age weight babies. Then if there is any history of preterm labor in the mother, it has to be aggressively managed because we do not want to have preterm babies who in turn are more predisposed to develop pneumonia. We have to consider intrapartum chemoprophylaxis in mothers at risk for GBS infection. Antipartum and intrapartum antibiotics in mothers 
must be considered in those women with premature, preterm rupture of membranes and those with chorioamnionitis. In fact, any woman who, ha woman who has chorioamnionitis, one must think about termination of pregnancy immediately without considering the period of gestation. Prevention and management of HIV infection is naturally very important because this is also one condition where the risk of pneumonia is increased in the neonate. And in case of meconium aspiration of the neonate, it is very important to clear the trachea of the meconium, especially of the particulate matter, immediately after birth because these neonates, if they aspirate the meconium, are found to be at a higher risk of developing pneumonia. Besides proper care of the inf infant, pneumococcal and influenza, inf immunization of the infant and immunoglobulins also have an important role in the control of pneumonia. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, I would be very happy to address them. Thank you. That was Dr. Amita Pandey, Professor in Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at King George's Medical University, KGMU. Uh, who is one of our distinguished guests on uh, one of the panels on our program. Well, that's moving on. We are now joined um, by another distinguished guest is Louis Prevost Dam, Director, Policy Advocacy and Communications at the International Vaccine Access Center, IVAC, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in the United States. Well, let's welcome Louis Prevost Dam. It's a privilege to be here and uh, to share the pneumonia and diarrhea progress report uh, that was recently issued by Johns Hopkins University. So I just want to make sure that uh, you can see my screen. Actually, is, yes. is the, okay. So is the presentation up? Yes. Great. So this is a, the pneumonia and diarrhea progress report is a, um, is a report that we issue every year. And this came out of what was called the GAP-D, or Global Action Plan for Pneumonia and Diarrhea. And what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the report and some of the results. This is the sixth year that we have done this report. And the reason that we're doing it, as uh, the previous speaker, Dr. Pandey, pointed out, that pneumonia and diarrhea are very, very significant child health problems around the world. Every minute, six children die from either pneumonia and diarrhea, and together, these diseases claim the lives of 1.5 million children. Pneumonia alone causes 16% of all childhood deaths, so that's a fairly significant chunk. And pneumonia is actually quite treatable and quite preventable and this is why it is so important that the countries uh, look at the global action plan for pneumonia and diarrhea, develop their own action plans and figure out what that they can do to protect, prevent and treat pneumonia and childhood diarrhea. So the WHO and UNICEF have issued what's called GAP-D as well as targets for countries to, um, to consider and to work towards. The first one, uh, protecting exclusive breastfeeding, and there's many other targets that are not included here, but for simplicity's sake, this provides guidance to the country as to where they should be. Breastfeeding, um, exclusive breastfeeding for six months, uh, the WHO and UNICEF have set a target for 50%, while um, prevention, in other words, using various vaccines, and I'll talk about the vaccines that are included in the target, is 90% vaccine coverage, while treatment and access to care also has a 90% uh, target goal. Just, hmm. For some reason, this isn't... Uh, 
going down. Okay. So what we've developed is a, what's called a GAPD scoring system. And we use this scoring system to rate countries on where they are versus the target. There are 10 factors that uh, come into play in the GAPD score. And for most of these factors, there are data available. In some cases, there are data missing. But um, what this allows us to do is see how close countries are in reaching that score. So if you look at over on the left-hand side of the screen, there are a series of prevention interventions. And this is including um, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, the third dose as a measure measles, first dose, Hib, which is also the pentavalent vaccine, third dose, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, third dose, and last dose of rotavirus vaccine as prevention indicators. While the treatment indicators for pneumonia are care of an appropriate healthcare provider and access to antibiotics when a child is diagnosed with pneumonia. And at the very end, you'll see that exclusive breastfeeding is an indicator for both pneumonia and diarrhea. The countries we looked at include the top 15 countries in terms of burden. And as you can see, India already all the way over to the right is a very, very significant contributor. Most of this is due to the sheer population size, but uh, the absolute burden is pretty substantial. So on the x-axis, you see the number of under five child deaths from pneumonia and diarrhea. And on the y-axis, the gap D score. So uh, the goal is really to be over to the left-hand side as high as possible with the highest score uh, available. Looking at the gap D scores, there's a target set for 86%. And as you can see from this, no single country in the top 15 has made the, that 15, uh, sorry, 86% target. And this is problematic. If you look at India and Nigeria, those are both in the 30s. Some of the other smaller countries, such as Chad and Somalia, are even in the 20s. Tanzania is perhaps the one country that has come close closest and for pneumonia has met targets for uh, pneumonia interventions. Going to the next slide, you'll see we, we look at both pneumonia and diarrhea interventions scored. And consistently, the diarrhea, or excuse me, the pneumonia interventions are higher than the diarrhea intervention score. This is mainly because of implementation of various vaccine programs, as well as the treatments such as uh, ORS and, and zinc, which are lagging behind. Nonetheless, pneumonia still has a very, very long way to go to be able to meet the targets. Looking at the, the various countries, and delving deep, India, as mentioned previously, ranks first in global uh, pneumonia and diarrhea deaths. And this is problematic. But there is some very good news. Uh, as you may well know, no, uh, it, this current environment is really quite positive. And I don't think there's ever been the level of commitment political commitment to immunizing all children in the next five years. The targets are really quite aggressive, and India has introduced a number of new um, programs and interventions, Mission Indra-Danush being the um, probably most well-known, is very significant because this focuses not only on the problem as a whole, but goes down to a micro level to really look at where are the problems within the country and which are the districts that are really in need of most help. It's very exciting to see the, the progress that is happening and also the level of monitoring 
that is happening because we can talk about you know, making progress, but unless you're actually measuring the progress, you won't be able to see is the country moving forward. There are still some challenges in India, however. The pentavalent vaccine has seen a, a very slow rollout. It is uh, finally reaching the final states, but the states that are left are the high burden states, and hopefully this will be a lesson for the new vaccines that are following on to a pentavalent vaccine in that the burden of disease is in the high is in these high burden states. They happen to be the poorer performing states, so there is a reason why they're going last, but uh, the need is to get vaccines sooner to the places where they're needed and hopefully strengthen those systems uh, where they can really make a big impact. The uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which is also a very, very important vaccine for pneumonia, has uh, not been introduced yet, so a decision is still to be an official decision is still to be made, and the hope is that that will be introduced very shortly in the country because that has the potential of making a very significant impact on uh, childhood pneumonia, not only for the disease itself, but also uh, preventing deaths by um, also addressing antibiotic resistant serotypes of disease. The rollout of rotavirus vaccine for diarrhea has been announced in India in four states. However, that is a very limited rollout and the burden of diarrhea is also very significant. So if you look at child health, pneumonia and diarrhea really go hand in hand and it's difficult to not talk about one when talking about the other. I had mentioned previously that there were low levels of access to treatment and this is, this is very significant because many of these deaths if caught early, if diagnosed early and uh, for pneumonia if children receive antibiotics right away that can really save lives and this is important. And the future, finally, the future financing is a big concern because these programs do cost money. Uh, there is a cuts in the health budget, but also um, more, uh, more responsibility at the state level. So ensuring that, that the states are financing the systems needed to introduce the vaccine, putting in the manpower to ensure that these vaccines can be delivered to the very last mile to make sure that every single child receives the vaccines that they can possibly receive, and ensuring the commitment of the um, program is going to be important. Turning to Africa, the second ranking country is Nigeria. And uh, Nigeria has also made a lot of progress in being declared polio free by WHO. This was several years after India's announcement. Uh, they have successfully rolled out two vaccines, pentavalent vaccine, and are in the midst of introducing a pneumococcal vaccine, which has been introduced in many areas. There are significant funding gaps, so this is a common theme across many of the countries. As they graduate from Gavi support, they will be needing to raise money to ensure the sustainability of their programs. And there is weak central coordination of uh, Gap D strategies and um, needs to be increased accountability. They are putting in place a scorecard system so this can now be monitored, but it will take some time to ensure that the pneumonia uh, interventions that are needed are actually reaching the states where they are needed most. And again, inadequate access to prevention and treatment. And the third country that we highlight is also Indonesia, uh, similar to India, has a very, very decentralized system and that is a concern, reaching the areas where the deaths are occurring. They have introduced their own indigenous pentavalent vaccine 
But in terms of pneumococcal vaccines, uh, those are still many years away. They will also be graduating from Gavi support so that there are financial constraints. And with 17,000 islands, it is pretty important that they reach the places that they need uh, to be reaching. They will be needing funding for new vaccines. And one uh, area of concern is that moving forward, we've seen in the recent year that they've had declining coverage rates for the most basic vaccine, and that would be DTP3. So in conclusion, um, we are looking at the creation of countries from Gavi that there is a global action plan that countries could be meeting, but we are concerned about their ability to meet obligations. And in some large countries, the ability to close some of the significant funding gaps. There will be additional focus needed in to bridge the equity gap because um, disease burden is quite uneven and access to care is quite uneven. So focus on equity is, is certainly important. And new suppliers will be needed for uh, supply security and vaccine affordability. And political will will need to be significantly accelerated if the targets are to be achieved. So thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to talk about the report. And it is available on the worldpneumoniaday.org web website or the Johns Hopkins website if you wish to view completely. Thank you. That was uh, Louis Prevodam. Director of Policy Advocacy and Communications at International Vaccine Access Center, IVAC, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in the United States. You had... Thank you, Louis. A special thanks to Louis. I think it's, it must be very, very early in the morning in your part of the world, Louis. And we are really grateful to you for being on this webinar. Great, great effort on your part. We are really grateful. Thank you, and it's, it's my pleasure to be on. Thank you for inviting me. Now, uh, I open the session to, for questions and answers from the participants. As I said, you may, raise your, you may send your questions by chat or raise your virtual hand to ask your questions yourself. We already have uh, Manpreet Kaur Mathuru from India. Uh, Manpreet, would you like to ask your question? Hello, Manpreet. Hello. Ma yes, Manpreet, please ask, say your comments and ask your question. Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this webinar. It was very, very informative for me. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask is that uh, um, what my experience had been is that uh, uh, especially in India in the rural, uh, rural setup, uh, the main cause uh, is uh, you know either there is no information or lack of information about early symptoms of uh, most of the diseases that includes even pneumonia as well, and uh, the primary healthcare is already a challenge uh, in those pockets. So, uh, if somebody from the program or somebody uh, from the uh, government side is uh, available over here, I mean, I was just want, uh, wanting to ask that are there any strategies being defined to um, actually uh, run some sort of uh, you know awareness program uh, at the rural set, uh, at the uh, grassroots level? And another question that I wanted to ask is this, uh, in the country there are already uh, TB awareness, HIV awareness, malaria awareness programs are going on. So are there any uh, talks going on about uh, a combined strategy of uh, you know, uh, spreading the awareness, including pneumonia, rather than having individual strategies for each disease? So that was my question. Would any of the panelists please like to answer that? Dr. Amita Pandey, what about uh, the strategy to uh, for rural awareness? If you could just repeat her question. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
Yes, uh, please repeat, Manpreet. Yeah, my uh, uh, question was uh, that uh, as per my experience and uh, specifically in rural setups in India, the main problem in uh, very uh, the, the main problem is either very little or no information about early signs of the disease. So uh, this is one of the major cause of deaths. This is what uh, you know uh, our observation of the field is uh, in children. And if we have somebody representing program or some uh, you know policy makers here on this tab chat right now, or maybe somebody from the media as well, that uh, you know. Um, uh, if they can just give some uh, information about if we have, uh, you know, uh, if there are any uh, strong strategies are being defined to address this challenge, then another. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Can I just answer your question now? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh, Mantri, it so happens that I do agree that if you look at the remote pockets in the rural areas, Awareness about the symptomatology of pneumonia is definitely very poor. The uh, family members are not educated about rec recognizing the early signs of pneumonia. But you know, in certain pockets, especially in Maharashtra and in Uttar Pradesh, uh, there has been a multicentric project from ICMR, which was act which is actually based on the concept of Sisu Shishu Rakshak. Uh, and it was actually put forth by Dr. Bank. I'm sure if you are from India, you must have heard about him. He's a very famous uh, person working in the field of social and preventive medicine. So um, uh, the whole project involves training of women from the particular village about recognizing signs of early signs of pneumonia, early signs of dehydration in diarrhea, and these women are called Shishu Rakshaks. So they are basically counseled and told about the basics of neonatal management. And it was over the years it was observed that the villages where these Shishu Rakshaks were working, the neonatal mortality due to pneumonia and due to diarrhea was found to decrease significantly. And I think the government of India is actually working towards uh, reinf uh, like uh, implementing such a kind of project all over India, especially in the pockets or in the states where the neonatal mortality and the infant mortality are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Statum Anderson has a question to ask. Statum, would you ask your question yourself? Yes, I, I, that would be yes. great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So, um, on to the discussions. I'd like to know, um, you've mentioned, several people have mentioned how important antibiotics are. Can you talk about um, antibiotics to improve access to child-friendly antibiotics at a dispersible time? What the supplies are like? Are there enough, is there enough of this stuff around yet, or are we still trying to get there? Um, or is this about um, whether amoxicillin is uh, prioritized by health systems or not? Because I understand uh, uh, countries, some countries are, are only just putting it on their list as, as a preferred um, antibiotic. Hello? Uh, Louis, are you there? I think that question was directed at Louis. Louis, are you there? Louis? Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I'm having problems muting and unmuting. Oh, okay. So, I... I the the question about antibiotics seems to be a question in every country that we've looked at. I do not know the specific um, situation in India about antibiotics, but I do suspect that there has been some issues ensuring that there are sufficient supplies of the appropriate antibiotics uh, to be able to treat pneumonia. 
So this some, is something that needs to be a priority, and uh, perhaps somebody that is down on the ground uh, could comment a bit more. Thank you. Uh, I'm again requesting the participants to please keep on sending your questions. Uh, also, uh, there is a question that uh, uh, this uh, Dr. Amita Pandey maybe will be able to address this. If women want, they cannot exclusively breastfeed due to family pressures and culture some, sometimes. How does one counsel them or have you come across such cases when uh, we know how important exclusive breastfeeding is. Uh, I would just like to say that on the contrary to the mm. common belief, it is very easy to counsel women to go in for exclusive breastfeeding. In fact, in the rural part of India, women are actually programmed and they know that they have to breastfeed. The only problem that we used to face while counseling women to go for exclusive breastfeeding was in the urban elites. But nowadays, thanks to the awareness on the net and in the books and in the newspapers, uh, women have realized that breastfeeding is actually very, very important. So even in the working group of women, we have seen that they are very strongly motivated to go in for exclusive breastfeeding. So they keep asking us how they can take out express breast milk, how they can store it in the refrigerator, warm it and then give it to their baby. So contrary to the popular belief, I feel that these days women are very programmed to go in for exclusive breastfeeding. Okay, thanks to doctors like you. So you have seen an increase in the number of women who are yeah, certainly, certainly a tremendous increase in the number, especially in the urban elite and in the working women also. Alright, I think Manpreet has another question to ask. Manpreet, would you like to ask your question? The question was uh, again in continuation to my first question was that you know lack of awareness at the at the rural uh, setups. The the question that I wanted to ask in continuation to that was that there are already very big large level awareness programs running currently, taking you know. Uh, 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 taking for, uh, forward the TB awareness, HIV, malaria. I just wanted to uh, um, ask somebody who could just give some information on that, that are there are uh, there are any action being taken place to have some sort of combined strategy to spread awareness about pneumonia, uh, in, uh, in including, I mean, all these four uh, uh, disease uh, diseases that, uh, you know, uh, common stakeholders can, uh, you know, discuss and craft out a combined strategy to spread awareness about all these uh, things because I mean I think it would be more effective rather than having individual strategies for each uh, disease you know because all all these players are are present at the at the field so uh, I just get somebody answer that question <laughs> hello Hello? Yes. Okay. Any answers? Yes, yes. So one, um, one thing that I could add about combined strategies is we've participated in, in um, workshops with the government talking about inter integrated approaches. And this is very much top of mind because, as you say, it does not make sense to have uh, vertical strategies continue. Child health needs to be considered holistically and both at the community level as well as in the government there are many benefits to talking about the diseases holistically rather than separately. So the, the um, action plan is actually an integrated action plan for pneumonia and diarrhea, and it doesn't just stop at pneumonia and diarrhea, but does cover other diseases, and they're trying to take more of a primary care approach. Mission Interdenouche, in particular, when they go to the, uh, the various districts, is focused on the needs of the community rather than individual diseases.
Uh, again, uh, we are saying that there are uh, vaccines, but uh, like in India, they are not being rolled out. They are being rolled out uh, partly in different states. Uh, why is it so? Is it uh, the cost factor? Uh, what 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 actually prevents the government from not introducing these vaccines? And also, Louis, you talked about some new vaccines. You mentioned about some new vaccines. Uh, I would like to right. know a little more about them. Okay, so the so the first question is is a very good question, and one might think that it has to do with cost of the vaccines, but because vaccines are centrally procured, every state has access to the vaccines that um, that are procured. Now, what does seem to per slow the rollout of vaccines to the places where they need them are the strength is the strength of the system and the ability of each state to be able to handle the vaccines at to and there's been an emphasis on ensuring that there's better communication in the states that there is better manpower and training is is clearly one of the issues that has arisen in some cases, there needs to be cold storage and transportation, so those um, factors may not be su sufficiently in place and may impact the ability to roll out a vaccine. In, uh, additionally, political will does play a role because uh, the states that understand the value of the vaccines and see the value of, of health as a priority are the ones often that are getting the vaccines first. Now eventually it will be rolled out to all of the various states, but uh, the ones that really understand uh, the, the priority are uh, seeming to get the vaccines first. The, with the new vaccines, so the newest vaccine is pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. That vaccine uh, has not yet been recommended by Government of India, but there are discussions going on and we hope that it would be recommended very soon. That vaccine will also require adequate systems to be able to monitor progress. So what that requires is that there be uh, centers or universities or um, some type of site within the, the particular state or district that is able to monitor the burden of disease, that's able to monitor the impact. And that's not an easy thing to set up, to have those capabilities within the states. So uh, that oftentimes becomes something that uh, is meant to be of benefit, but because they're trying to set up the studies to be able to monitor the progress may actually delay the introduction of the vaccine. But there's many, many factors, and you know, part of it is just making sure that the uh, individual locations that are receiving the vaccine have the system to support that rollout. Uh, thank you, Louis. Then the vaccine work. The vaccine works for elderly people also. We hear a lot many cases of pneumonia in the uh, older population, so the vaccine works for them too. Uh, that's a great question. So there's two there's two vaccines. It's it's um, one is one is for the children, the other is for the elderly. They are both the so actually there are two vaccines for the elderly. One is a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, and the second is the newer one, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which is the same vaccine that is used in children but can be given to older adults to help prevent uh, pneumonia. Now, um, the other aspect of prevention of adult, vaccine, adult disease that is also really quite interesting and quite promising is that children often um, are the carriers of disease and when you start reducing the amount of disease in children, that can also reduce the burden in the adults. So what we've seen is an indirect effect 
that um, the vaccinating of children can also prevent disease in adults, but there are two strategies. One is to ensure that children are vaccinated, and secondly, to immunize older adults as well. Thank you. That's that's very interesting uh, information. Also, Louis, sometimes it uh, you know on World Pneumonia Day, I know children are very precious, but so are our elders. Uh, the messaging somehow is more concentrated on more directed towards children. I wish there was some message for pneumonia in the elder uh, older people as well. Yeah. Sure. And, it also and thank you. Thank you for that comment. I, I do agree that the, the messaging is biased towards children, and that is the current priority. There are some of the organizations in the Global Coalition Against Child Pneumonia that have started taking up dis messaging around um, disease in older adults as well. So you should be seeing that uh, okay. increase. Bit. Sorry, you brought in a very important uh, question or rather um, fact that every minute six children die from pneumonia and diarrhea. Um, I think a concern is raised, will the lawmakers around these concerned countries will be able to meet uh, the, um, the targets set by, well, by, by, by your organization perhaps or by 2025 will be able to prevent child deaths from pneumonia and diarrhea? We, we believe these targets are actually quite achievable. They're aggressive, but it is a, it's, a, it's got to be a priority because if the countries are not working towards that priority, we are not going to be coming close. Now, the other um, aspect of childhood death that's very, very challenging and needs to be a higher priority is the neonatal deaths because those deaths are even more challenging to prevent. We have the tools available today. We have many of the interventions, and it's a matter of making sure that we're using, the countries are using what they have and making sure that they're using their voice to show that this is a priority. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there any, uh, I just wanted to know if there is any accurate lab-based diagnostic test for pneumonia? And if yes, what, what is that test? Um, um, so, so I don't know if, so I don't know if Dr. would like to answer that one. Like to answer that uh, Dr. Pandey, Dr. Amita Pandey, would you like to answer? Any yes. of you can answer. Yes, we actually yes. rely on yes. chest x-ray for diagnosis. That is the cheapest and that is today. Diagnosis is the new diagnosis. And then for the organism. For the organism. Okay. Uh, also, is a pneumonia a special serious concern in pregnant women living with HIV? Uh, Dr. Ramita Pandey, would you be able to? Yes, we do get to see pneumonia in HIV infested women once in a while, but actually, but actually, uh, it is more of a concern. Concern for like it actually is not very very young. Recently, it had. Hello. 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 Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Yes. We do get to see pneumonia in HIV infected women once in a while who come to us with respiratory distress. That is not very frequent. We do get to deliver HIV positive women almost every day. Because ours is a center where we have an ERT center where we retroviral therapy and where we register it. Where we register it. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? I'm asking the participants once again to send their questions by chat function or raising the virtual hand if there are any, any more questions coming in. 
Uh, otherwise, in any case, we will be sending the webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentations of the panelists and other reference material to all the participants. Uh, Tatum wanted to ask a question. Tatum, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, Tatum, if I could. Uh, yes. Um, could. Yes. Um, Please. Could you talk about antibiotic yeah, resistance? Antibiotic resistance. How will delays in will rollouts delays of vaccine rollout and delays in decisions on rollouts of vaccine exacerbate that? Exacerbate that. Okay. Can can you hear me now? Now? Yes. Yes, we can. So um, um, there's. There's obviously various antibiotic resistance. One of the more important types of antibiotic resistance is are the pneumococcal or having to do with pneumococcus. And there's a and there's a in particular one strain that is very antibiotic resistant um, that is contained within the vaccine. So one of the goals would be to introduce. I'm sorry. There's there's an echo on the phone that's 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 um, bothering me. But I'll try and answer. There's one of one one of the serotypes is serotypes is the vaccine and vaccine. And acceleration of the vaccine of the vaccine that particular that antibiotic resistant serotype. And what we and hope is that there will be that prudent that use of antibiotics so that, um, so that antibiotics are given antibiotics are given that the pressure on um, on um, Increasing resistance, increasing resistance does not occur. Does not occur, and we do expect and that the vaccine, the vaccine help somewhat with the antibiotic resistance issue. issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we've had had a wonderful session today. Uh, thanks to our panelists, they have been just excellent. And again, special thanks to Louis for waking up so early in the morning and being with us. Thanks to all the participants. We will be, and of course, to Ashok Ramsuru, who so well moderated the program. We will be, as I said, we will send the links of the webinar recording and PowerPoint presentations of panelists and other reference material to all our participants. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good day. Thank you very much. Good day.